Hey, what's up? It's the Flyover Libertarian Podcast, where three unimportant people from an unimportant place give you the opinion that you didn't ask for. I'm Josh, a.k.a. Iowa Cap, And I'm the Rural Rothbard. And I am Darabelli. So, what are we talking about? We're talking about Trump tonight, because he's still uh, being talked about for some reason. You can see that or they talk about the 90-year-old dementia patient who is the current president. So, you know, there needs to be <laughs> yeah, something to something be... to, to uh, uh, divert attention away from the slow mental decline of the current leader of the and free world. We could complain about him. <laughs> we could complain about him plenty, but that would just be the low-hanging fruit. <laughs> I think even his own administration knows what we would have to say, so. Yeah, and it seems like... Uh, There'll be plenty of time to talk about that, but, um... Not if Kamala has her way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Uh, but yeah, I, th- I think there's a... You know, there's much for a libertarian to talk about, uh, about the Trump administration, and we've... Yeah, we're just gonna nail our 95 theses yeah. to his door right now. Let's go. And, and some of it feels like we're, uh literally beating a dead horse on this. Um, But also, I think there's a point at which, like, a lot of people like me spent most of the Trump administration defending him just because of what they were attacking him for was stuff that was stupid. And... (laughs) Yeah, or uh, misquoting him. Honestly, being very disingenuous uh, with how they quote him. So... And yeah, that, it's, that, that's not cool either. So we uh, we probably got caught defending him for a lot of those things, but uh, now we're, we're yeah. going to nail our 95 theses to the door and, and complain about him. Yeah, it's true. It's kind of like I, I made a tweet the other day, and, and it kind of applies. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slightly adjust it because I don't know that that would fly on all of our audio carriers. But uh, it's kind of like it's not that I was pro-Trump. I was anti-anti-Trump. Uh, the people who were anti-Trump were... were more problematic than he was, but there is a lot to criticize about Trump. And I, and you know, we could go about his, uh, there's a lot we could go about, but, um, the topic that you had kind of floated out was this concept that, um, even though he had probably the most conservative support, um, you, it's, it's kind of hard, a hard sell to call him a conservative. Yeah, and um, the reason anyways. why it's coming up again now is there's there's this section of the um it's like the fundamentalist section of the Republican Party that really likes to it's like their virtue signaling by showing their support for Trump. So, uh I think my main example is Christy Noem, the governor, the governor of South Dakota, where she's pretty pretty good on a lot of conservative things. Um and even pretty great on some Liberty items. She actually spoke at the, what was that, uh, Liberty Con or something? At, it was in Rapid City? Uh, I believe Freedom Fest. Freedom Fest. She spoke at Freedom Fest in, in Rapid City. So um, there, were some, there were some good people there. But she just, you know, she just loves to make it so clear she's in Trump's camp. And that just should be seen as in opposition to her uh, being a conservative and and her being about liberty. So even though she did some good things uh, to oppose federal lockdowns, um, it's like if Trump had been for the lockdown, she would have locked her state down immediately. (laughs) Like, it's like, uh. so that's why this is coming up again is because there's people that that are are supposed to be good conservatives that are, are just align them with although uh, i'll say trump. for her that she didn't lock down when trump was for lockdowns sure. like a lot of people conveniently on the right forgot that trump was the president when we locked the country down <laughs> it's weird that yeah. everyone forgets that yeah they're kind but of forgetting he, that now aren't they yeah he was he and he wasn't out there being like oh this isn't a good idea like he was cheerleader because he's an it. authoritarian he was the one, He's he was the one throwing the microphone. He's an authoritarian. He'll he was the one throwing the to. microphone in front of Fauci, the same Fauci that he calls a fraud later. Yes, but but he's the one throwing so, the microphone. In his hey face. guys, listen to this guy. Yeah, yeah. He's an authoritarian, and, and, so he needs to get credibility first. Well, I think, and and ultimately, 
this is not an, a, a unique take, but ultimately, like, again, Trump, what Trump represented was always better than Trump himself. Like, Trump's, oh yeah, we Trump, just watched. Re- we just rewatched uh, the Dark Knight Rises. What what Two Face represented is better than what Two. Yeah. What, Har- what what Harvey Dent actually is. What he represents is more. Yeah. Better. The 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 populist rejection of the uh, ruling elite that was well worth the ride, and I, I would lie if I didn't say it, it was the most entertaining presidency in my lifetime. Yeah. Although, hey, having a dementia patient is quite a ride uh, in itself. But, but yeah, it's, it's ultimately he is, he is who he is. Like, he's a guy who is bombastic, who is, um, who is able to, to ride, he's able to accomplish success on pure force of will and, force of personality like by being the biggest person in the room he, he's he's kind of like the the equivalent of just a, a, a you know a big guy in the paint he just throws his his body around and people have to move you know uh, sorry that was a basketball reference uh, i know it's shocking since it came from my mouth but uh like that that's all he was and and he had and, and this is something that a lot of people have had critique about him even i would say some good people on the right had critiques of Trump in this way that he just was not ideological in any way. He didn't have any ideology. He was of. a Republican because it was the best way for him to market himself into the yeah, presidency. And, like, if I he, mean, he would have if there was yeah, another option that it. fit him better. He would have just right. picked that. There was nothing ideological about his choice, right? A- absolutely, and and, and that's um, why he used to be yeah. a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Well, he used to be a Democrat because he was trying to make his way in the New York real estate yeah. world, and you had to be a Democrat. There's nothing principled, and there's nothing ideological right. about him. He's just doing what he does in order to get where he wants to go. Um, and, and and without any sort of ideology, he ends up hanging. Like you know, you point out like the Trump administration, they, what they they boast about for for their. Um, what, what, and, and this, and we could even see this during the presidential uh, debates, is he would brag about how much money he spent. Um, and it's somewhat interesting uh, that conservatives didn't call him out on that, because these are still the people who have Reagan posters ha- hanging up in their room, right? Like these are still the people who who. Uh, uh, voted Tea Party Republicans like this. This is not a different group, right? Like, I, I feel like if we're going to talk about how unconservative he was, that's where we got to start. Like he he broke records as a president, but as we said in the pre-show, it's kind of a race to the bottom. Every new president breaks records for uh, for spending. Um, you know, by now maybe Biden's already beaten his record. Who knows? It's it's possible, maybe even probable. But he brags about this this record spending bill, um, and then we're all out here being like, and then he's out here being like, "Oh, Biden's uh, Biden's economy is terrible." Well, how, wonder how that happened. Uh, like, where did he find all this money to to start throwing at people to stay home? You got it for him. Like you're you're the one who filled his his coffers, and uh, now he's just yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's that's kind of reality there. Yeah, you know. Yeah, there were just so many examples of, um, yeah, he just made it so clear. There were so many examples of the Republican Party being just the Democrats, but 10 years behind. Because he wasn't principled, it just made it so painfully obvious that the Republicans and Democrats are the same party, just 10 years approximately behind. Um, Like, you mentioned the budget earlier. Now, with Biden in office, Ted Cruz is complaining about how much the federal government's spending and Mm -hmm. how uh, we need to do something about this budget crisis. But when they had the power to change it, they never even tried. Yeah, I mean, on the on the way on the Trump wave, they took control of everything. Yeah, they easily could have done something about it, Uh, but (laughs) but they didn't. That's that's 
just what happens. And, and it's like, if this was the first time, it'd be one thing, but it's the fact that it's every single time. Every single time there's a new Republican takeover, uh, they they govern, what do they say? They govern like Democrats and run like Libertarians. Uh, like they run for an office on these like financial, we got to get the budget under control. And then they get elected. And, and honestly, uh, I think some people have done some real research to say that Republicans expand the budget more because there's no one standing against them. And they want to, they spend just as much as the Democrats do, but at least with the Democrats, the Republicans stand against them. And, and, and that's, I guess there's kind of in that a, a, a great, a good um, argument for just keeping the Republicans around as the opposition party, like keeping them, like give, give them control of the house and the Senate, but keep a Democrat in the white house. That seems to be the best. Uh, I think someone actually has said that that's tends to be the best, uh, the best way of lining it up for Liberty. Give, give Congress to the Republicans, give the president to the Democrats. And then, uh, the Republicans spend their entire time trying to crap on the Democrats' legacy, and the Democrat can't get anything done, and so we yeah. win. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I, I'd say the only actual conservative thing, big conservative thing that Trump passed was uh, his tax cut bill, which um, seemed to be mostly for the wealthy, but it was still a tax cut uh, nonetheless. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. but it didn't reduce spending. So there, there's really nothing conservative sure. about reducing revenue and, and increasing spending at the same time. Yeah, you could actually make not even just a libertarian, but a conservative case to say like a tax cut without a spending cut is actually bad. Yeah, like if you're ta if you're t cutting taxes while you don't stop spending, well, what's what good is that going to do? You know, you then you have less money, you have less money in taxpayer revenue to spend. So where does all that money come from? Fiat. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. And I think another thing about the Trump, and, and I guess we could, like I said, we, we've talked about, we could go after his, his foreign policy record, but it's interesting that he, there's a lot we can say good about his foreign policy record. Like he did um, not start a new war which by the perverse scale we're judging on yes. makes him uh, the most anti-war president yep. in our lifetime. Yep. Uh, but he also didn't stop any wars. But, but then we can also come back and say, well, you know, he was embattled uh, on that issue his entire time. Like, what would he have done if he had, um, if he had not hired the absolutely worst people to support him in ending a war would he have gotten out of afghanistan already would he have pulled more out of iraq i mean i i have a hard time believing that he would have done anything good about yemen because he just loves them saudis and all their their, their pretty pretty oil money but um you know who knows he could have pulled out but but uh is, and so even though we've, we've criticized, we, and, and there's some things that I think of, uh, Dave, uh, Scott Horton on Dave Smith's part of the problem did talk about how, you know, and Trump not only did some, didn't do good things, there were some bad things he did. Um, getting out of the Iran deal, of course, first thing that comes to mind, and he did some pretty, um, uh, he didn't do, he, he did uh, some pretty dumb things with Israel, um, but, you know, Republican. Uh, but, uh, gotta keep Ben Shapiro happy. Yeah. But all the while, and then this is the interesting thing because I would say that I'll say this. I didn't vote for Trump. Shockingly. You know, everyone knows who I voted for. Ye 2024. Um, but, uh, but I understood, I've always understood why someone would vote for Trump. Like, I, I kind of, I, I have a lot of, you know, I, I work in the church and I have a lot of conservative people in my church. I never once looked at them and said, yeah, I don't get it. Why would you vote for this guy? I understood it. Uh, when, when your opponent is, when the Democratic Party is front uh, spotlighting all the worst parts of the left, and, and particularly all this critical race theory stuff, um, I can understand why they would see this guy as the only other option. 
But let's talk about that, the social conservative aspects of Donald Trump. Like, the fact that, like, I, I shared, I, I saw a meme on Twitter and I retweeted it the other day of the, the, the spectrum on, on, uh, on, on LGBTQ rights, uh, went from the left, which had a picture of, um, that really creepy dragon lady looking, uh, drag queen story, our girl, all the way to LGBTQ for Trump. And that more than anything is like, like there was a serious debate about whether or not a porn star should be invited to a conservative con convention. And, yeah, and forget, not a yeah, forget what he <laughs> may or may not have accomplished in the White House. Just ask yourself if that's anything you expected four years ago. <laughs> yeah, and, and he certainly didn't stand in the way of it. I mean... It's it's been beaten to death by a lot of the never trumper right, but man has multiple divorces, uh, has slept with porn stars. I mean, let's, if we're going to be honest, there are some creepy connections between him and Epstein. Uh, we don't we don't know to the extent of it. it. Doesn't seem like he was as involved in Epstein as uh, say the Clintons were or. Um, Alan Dershowitz, who's suddenly the voice of reason for some reason. Um, you know, you've got all... It's He doesn't have maybe the depth of ties to him, but there is clear connections to him. And he's been getting a pass on that. Like, no, no one on the right seems to want to investigate it. And it seems like the left only wants to investigate it in order to uh, throw off suspicion of, you know, their their guy, Bill. But the he he it's it's not even like he came in and said uh well i've changed my mind i'm i'm really i see the i see the error of my ways i'm i'm going to be a good christian man he, he it's perhaps the most blatant christian pandering of our lifetime <laughs> under under trump like it's it's pretty yes, funny every republican does christian pandering but the most blatant of it happened this under Trump. One was, like, yeah, this one was so bad it was funny. It like as much as it wasn't the terrible okay, the fact that the left got so bent out of shape over his picture in front of that that church holding a Bible, like okay, yeah, this was not an actual war crime, people. It was some pretty horrendous uh pandering. It, it was very cringy. If it wasn't turned into a scandal on the left, that's what we would be talking about. How cringy it was. The fact that he just pulls a Bible verse out of the air and miss, uh, and miss, uh, set, uh, miss speaks on what it, you know, two Corinthians. Which yes, I get, I get it. The Europeans call it two Corinthians, but Americans don't. He <laughs> he clearly just got, someone handed him a, a card and said, "This is your favorite Bible verse," and he's like, "Okay, two Corinthians, let's do that." Uh, it it was the most cringy Christian uh, pandering, which ultimately, like, if he had any sense, he could easily have looked around and said, yeah, yeah, they're not going to buy this. Um, if, if he <laughs> had just gone out there and said, here's the deal, Christians, y'all know who I am. I'm not one of you, but you have to admit I'm a better choice than the other guy. Then I would have been like, okay, that's fair. That's that's probably fair. Yes, yes. The guy who uh, has married porn stars is probably a little bit better than the guy who wants to take your children and send them to Drag Queen Storybook Hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would say yeah. You got you got a case there. But but he still tried to do the pander thing, and uh, yeah. and at the same time, very very clearly pandered to the LGBT for Trump crowd, which. I haven't noticed that. Do you have a good example? Well, during his first campaign, he sees a rainbow flag and it says uh, gays oh, for yeah. Trump, pulls yeah. it up on stage. He does. He did stuff like that all the time. Yeah. And um, it, it's there, there's something to be said about this. Okay, so um, if you want to say broadly rightist, um, 
even there, I'm a little bit uncertain that he counts. But if we're talking right in the sense of reaction to the craziness of the left, um, yeah, I mean, he, he was a good, well, he was a good avatar for that. Um, he represented everything that the champagne socialist does not. He was not any of that. And so he made a great avatar for being anti-left. He himself did very little, and you could argue more damage for the cause of a right turn away from the left. Partly due to ineptitude, the fact that even though he was, even while he was talking about all these things, it's like someone forgot to remind him he was the president of the United States and could stop teaching CRT in the, to the military. Like he actually could have done that. You, I don't know if you know this, Don, but you were the commander in chief. I, I don't know if he missed that memo. You know, like uh, he, he, it's like he never stopped being in campaign mode and started being president mode. Um, and so the good he could have done, he didn't do. The things he did do were pretty detrimental to the cause of conservatism, liberty, right-wing anything. And ultimately, he was so inept that he was unable to stop. Um, okay, to, to use their phrase, he was unable to stop the steal. Like, if, uh, I, I don't know that I remember, I'm on record anywhere, but I remember say, uh, thinking, I don't know if we've actually talked about this on the podcast, but, um, I think that election was very fishy. There's a lot of fishy things going on, and I think we're, we're seeing some of them come out. I think Trump has a pretty good case for there being significant election fraud. Enough to get Joe Biden elected? I don't know. Like, would he have won even without it? I don't know. Um, we're never, there's literally no way to figure that out. But if he, if he actually believed it was going to happen, why didn't he have his people in place in every poll, polling place? Why did he not overwhelm the, the election oversight process? He was the freaking president of the United States. You're telling me he couldn't have done this? Like, tin pot dictators give their people the, uh, the, 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 the lie of thinking they're voting all the time. And he couldn't do a little bit of tin pot dictatoring? Like, he, it's, it's just, he was just so inept and so incapable of accomplishing anything that he got involved, like, what does whining after the fact do? Like, it is way too late to turn anything over. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, Q. He's not going to be president. You could put a due date on anything. He's not going to be president again. We're not going to wake up in the morning and find out it was all a bad dream and Trump is actually the president. Why is that the case? Because this idiot couldn't stop it. And so... There's a sense in which I want to, like, shake some of these people and be like, I get why you were for Trump. Can you see why he was such a failure? Now, how can you do better next time? Like, how, how can you actually, like, we saw that this didn't work. Yeah. The, the bull in the china shop buffoon didn't work. How are we going to actually stop the government from telling you how to raise your children? Yeah. And and shutting down your church and all this stuff. And I think that's something that can we loop back around and talk about what actual conservative theory is? Because mm. I think at this point now it's just totally been lost and anybody who's a Republican doesn't even anybody that's been a Republican uh since the two thousands only doesn't even know anymore because both yeah. parties look so similar and on a whim, uh they'll change their platform. It's like, what is conservative theory actually supposed to boil down to? Yeah. Well, I mean, this, the, the hard part about it is that, um, w one of the strongest voices and founders of modern conservatism, uh, was anti ideological. And so he was very much opposed to doing this. And so I think there's a bit of like, so we're talking about Russell Kirk. 
And his big thing was that conservatism is not an ideology. Well, it would have done better if it was. Um, because eventually in the void, someone is going to step up and try and tell people what is it. Well, uh, it's it's following a strict interpretation of the cons- of the Constitution, they say. Well, even by that standard, no. Uh, Trump did pass the bump stock ban. I hate to keep banging that drum, but that did happen. Um, but but conservatism, like when you really look at it, it's it's hard to separate it from this concept of the Western Western civilization and tradition and uh the uh the the old school ideal like you know of um of meritocracy of the best uh the cream rising to the top um and things like that and and it's and and not in the sort of dog eat dog uh capitalistic sense because there is a strong uh, despite modern conservatism there is a strong anti-capitalistic uh streak um, in, in so, sort of old school conservatism, it, it's one of the areas that um, Rothbard and uh, company were hoping they could cure paleo conservatism of in in the paleo libertarian paleo conservative alliance. They were hoping that they could learn from the paleocons about uh, culture, and the paleocons would learn from the paleo libertarians about economics. Well. We did learn about culture from them. There was no learning about economics. Uh, in fact, the, the famous moment when Hoppe stood up and said, you're all a bunch of fascists and walked out of the room uh, is kind of the moment the paleo alliance ended, which is funny because everyone always comes at Hoppe like, oh, that paleo. He's the one who shut it down because he said, you're all a bunch of fascists and walked out. Um, and, um, and he's right. But but there is this sort of um, natural aristocracy idea that we libertarians did learn from the conservatives. That is kind of yeah in, in that and and it's this what but also the like the Western civilization is worth defending that um, uh, the value of tradition, um, to looking for for the good and the the classical virtues of the good, the true, the beautiful. Um, that's very much at the heart of this this conservative project, um, and and you just you can look at Trump and be like, okay, so was the good, the ethical, um, I guess you could say the moral, yeah, promoted by Trump himself and by the Trump administration? Absolutely not. Yeah, he's just so vapid. He doesn't have that. What mm-hmm. um yeah, and I think this this might uh make some people interested and some people triggered. What about? What does Western civilization have to do with that? And what's worth de- uh, defending or preserving about that? Sure. Um, if, you, if you have a... Uh, um, the best explanation I've heard of this is, is, is uh, from the uh, uh, Liberty Classroom, Tom Woods Liberty Classroom, uh, Jason Jewell's Western Civilization class, where he starts off by defining it, and he sees it as largely... Uh, the way he defines it is the he- the greco hebraic tradition as interpreted by the Romans and the Germans, the kind of Western civilization. So there's a kind of a, a process of the Hebrews, the Hebraic tradition, of course, comes to the Western civilization through Christianity, through Christianity bringing those Hebraic moral law virtues. And, and they particularly, they specifically interpreted it through their Greco-Christian lens. And of course, the Roman civilization in its Christianization, spread and uh, applied this Christian uh, truth, or at, at least a Christian worldview. Um, whether it was perfectly uh, biblical, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it was also being spread by a state, so there's that. Yeah, yeah, and it came with those kind of things. Um, but then the German... Uh, or, or you could say the Anglo interpretation of it, the the what what you would call European um, interpretation of it is is kind of what we mean by Western civilization, um, and so there's a strong um, like certain concepts that we've become accustomed to. This idea of the rule of law, it's a Western virtue. It's the idea that law itself, law not lawgivers, you know, rules not rulers, uh, is a Western civilization concept. 
Um, uh, like I said, the true, the good, the beautiful. Um, superiority of of things like philosophy in the mind and um. Would you say that objectivity yeah. goes with that too? Um, yeah, yeah, I would say that too. Yeah, the true, the good, beautiful. Uh, that has to come with objectivity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, those are things yeah. that are, are being opposed um, by a lot of people today. Yeah. Um, so it's just a, a system of thinking uh, and a tradition of uh, a tradition of thought and a, a way of thinking um, yeah. that, that many people think has, uh, has merit. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of, like, conservatism, um, and, and we've talked about some of these things before. I know, I think, uh, in episode uh, two, I think when when uh, they're talking about Iran war, and so to prevent that podcast from becoming dated, we talked a little bit about conservatism. Uh, but there's sort of a a, a sense in which uh, conservatism also has a a more realistic understanding of human nature, whereas the the leftist impulse is the idea that you can fix human nature. Well, the 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 rightist conservative impulse is to say, no, 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 people are just people. You can't fix it. We need to keep in mind human nature in whatever social order we create, um, which comes with it a kind of realism of the uh, of your ability to reshape a culture um, in your own image. Like there's a very strong case to be made for saying imperialism is a leftist ideology um, because it is this idea that you can come into another place and impose your virtues on them. Well, that's that's not a that's something that conservatism, at least the early conservatives were against. Now, of course, George W. Bush mucked that all up. But yeah, he's and, from and, Connecticut anyway. And conservative, yeah, freaking Yankee. Um, but <laughs> uh, but they also like, but also a uh, a sense of localism, I think, too, of conservatism, like this, like uh, you see this a lot on on what on paleo. Twitter is this idea, especially from I've seen a lot of Southerners and, and actually our friend uh, and democracy uh, Jared from uh, the Hopian from, from Hopian.org. Uh, he's talking a lot about that on Twitter about like reclaiming his Southern identity and and why is why is he doing that? It's because this sort of localism, like like this is kind of what I'm trying to channel a little bit with my sort of Iowan pride thing. I spent so much of my life thinking Iowa was a great place to leave, and uh, I'm trying to sort of say like, well, no, I am shaped by this state. Am I yeah. saying it's the best state in the nation? No, I'm saying it's. it's You're my seeking state. out the good, the true, the beautiful in yeah in that and, yeah, and so some people hear yeah. stuff like Western civilization or uh, pride in something like that, um, or uh, like with Jared and, and his southern roots and they think they link that to race and white and like oh you're proud of like your whiteness it's like that has nothing to yeah. do with it well and this is a place where i think the left is right there's this um idea that whiteness is the problem it's a problem that needs to be overcome and um and i think they're right I think there's a problem with that concept of whiteness. Like it is, it, it, like, am I white? Well, no, I'm, I'm Dutch. Like I, I, I'm, I, my race comes from Netherlands. I am of the tall Northwest Iowa Dutch stock. Like that's, that's who I am. Like white is such a leveling concept and it, and it is kind of, and I think that, I think they're even right about the cause of it. There's a sense in which it, it does come from this concept of supremacy. Like there's a, you know, when worried people start looking at another race rising up, well, we need to hang together. And so now we're not Irish and German and Dutch and Scottish. We're white. We're all in this together. I think there is a very collectivistic and, and anti-conservative way of thinking uh, of way of things with that. Um, just think about the way um, one of the uh, one of the really interesting black conservative movements is the Hotep movement, and it is very much a pro-black movement. 
but not in this sense of trying to, to ask white people permission in the sense of just be black and be great. And, and I think there's, uh, I don't know. I, I, do I agree with everything they say? No, I think their historical understandings of things is a little bit off. But I think there's something really interesting about that. And that is kind of an interesting conservative, like black conservative movement. Um, because then they'll look at kind of, quote, black conservatives and be like, well, y'all are just begging to be white. And there's a sense in which you're like, you know, they're, they're not wrong. <laughs> they're not wrong. There's There's some of them who are just kind of like, please accept me and please accept me because I'm uh, I'm not really like them. I'm like one of you guys. There's a really and, great and yeah. Ian Peel sketch called Black Re- Black Republicans. You should go look it up later. I really I probably should. Okay. <laughs> uh, but but that's kind of what's interesting about that is that that's that's where like I think this pro Western civilization concept is to be like not all. We also acknowledge that not all Western civilizations were the same. They were different expressions and local expressions of Western civilization. Um, and not all parts of it were good either. And the, no, That's no. the point, is looking for that and saying, well, this comes from this tradition, Yeah, and, and we find that this is uh, positive. Yeah. Well, I mean, because one thing that I talked about, and actually I talked about this on maybe the most recent, oh no, it wouldn't be the most recent. Man, all of it is flowing together in my mind. We, we've gone on a spree of recording a bunch of anarchist Bible study episodes because I was on vacation for on vacation or traveling through most of the month of July. So I have no idea when we recorded this, but I talked about how like is ironically the, the demise of Western civilization came packaged with Western civilization, this self critiquing thing. There's a self a natural method of self critique in the Western, uh, in, in the Western thought. Like no other culture, no other uh, civilizational mindset comes with an internal critique like Western civilization does. Like you go, like we are the only, Western culture is the only culture that would say our culture is no better than your culture. Like every other culture would look at our culture and be like, well, that's stupid. Like what, what you're doing is stupid. It's, or, or they would even package it as evil. But there's this sense of tolerance that comes in the Western civilization model uh for other ways of doing things um and even like i said the internal critiquing and so you could argue in fact i saw a meme of this and i think it was i think it was shared in one of the facebook groups in fact fact, it might have been an arco christian uh facebook group but it was uh that that meme of the soldier standing between the guns and the person laying down and they labeled the person laying down as western civilization and the person standing up as Western civilization and the uh, weapons coming at them as Western civilization. So Western civilization defending Western civilization from Western civilization. That's essentially what's happening with the modernist postmodernist controversy. That's it's, it's Western civilization turning in on itself. Um, and you could argue that's a major flaw in Western civilization is this us. Uh, their strength is also their weakness. They're going to, we're going to come apart at the seams because, uh, it came with the came packaged with the tools of its own demise, um, which is what happens whenever you make Christianity a means instead of an end. Which I think that is kind that is really my critique of Western civilization, and you see it a lot about people being like, "We need to return to Christendom so that we can have order, so that we can have a uh, flourishing society." <laughs> so Christianity is a means to an end. Well, Christianity no. makes a great end it's not a great means you you have me you have that you you end up doing things like uh oh in you know enslaving and murdering indigenous people because they're savages who uh are not conforming to western christian values yeah. well you know that's it justifies things like that so looping back around the beef is that these concepts are unknown slash forgotten in a modern uh, conservative party, basically. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we see these compromises and this constant drift to the left and vapid candidates that uh, have to pander to Christians in hilarious ways. I think my biggest beef 
And really, it's interesting that we started with a critique of Trump and we ended with a critique of conservatism. And I'll say largely, I've, I've said this often, I'm largely of the conservative uh, mentality. I think the biggest critique against conservatism is what Russell Kirk saw as its strength, the fact that it is not ideological. So it's a sense. It's a tendency. It's just and a so, compass. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tendency. It's a, it's a tendency to not want what is new. Yeah. Well, how far back do you go to what should be stuck with? Like, so you've got these conservatives who are following uh, Malice's law to a T. They're just progressives driving the speed limit. Well, why is that? It's because they have no ideological grounding to oppose these things. They just know it's new and it doesn't seem to be better than what was. And they're right in a sense, but they don't see how what was, like there's there's no uh, cause and effect in their mind of seeing how what was, that the thing that you're longing for, older leftism, older liberalism, that is what set up modern leftism and, and liberalism. Like this, this is all cause and effect. And so since they have no ideological grounding, they don't know what they're swinging at. Yeah. Like they, they don't know, they don't know who the real enemy is. And this is why you've got this constant tendency of conservatism to go after the wrong enemy. Their, their uh, compass yeah. will point towards the right, but if they're already pretty close to the left, it's, it's just going to bring them slightly to the right. It doesn't yeah. tell them how far to go to the right. Right. And it's kind of like, I think there's a, an interesting, you know, I picture it like that IQ, um, the, uh, what you call it, that IQ uh, bell curve, where you've got sort of rightism on the bottom and on the top. Like, rightism can be a very stupid, just sort of like, this is new, I don't like it, get rid of it. <laughs> or it can be, this is new, it's not working, go back. Yeah. There's a little bit of an antibody effect going on with the critical race theory thing. That they're just like, this is not the math that I learned. This is not the uh, the history that I learned. Let's stop it. Go back. And that's not better. Like, what what were you taught before? You were taught a different kind of lie. Like this sort of jingoistic America good, United States presidents great. Yeah. Everything good is because of the U.S. government. Like, that's not That's not better. better. <laughs> like, and again, this is, again, the problem with having no ideological grounding. You can't define, in fact, we attempt to define the right, and there are some things that we can say, absolutely, this, this is like, rightism, we can come up with a few principles of the right, but largely what it is, is, is it is anti-left. And unless you have a, it's, it's kind of like the issue of um, going on a journey without knowing the address that you're going to. Like, how do you know that you're driving down the right road? If you don't have a goal in mind, if you don't know where you're going. Yeah. And I think that is a, a major flaw of conservatism and rightism. And this is why I think the paleo libertarian strategy is not a flaw it's not as flawed as some of those Lalbertarian types want to say. This concept of reclaiming the rightist identity of libertarianism. We are like the old right. We're largely li libertarians, you know, Albert J. Nock, uh, H.L. Mencken, such like that. Like, there is a rightist, I think libertarianism is definitely rightist. We, do, we are anti-egalitarian. We are for natural hierarchies. We are, uh, yeah, yeah, and, 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 and we're against, we're anti-revolutionary. Like, all these, all these things that come with, with rightism, like, against the, the socialistic, egalitarian mindset um yeah reclaiming it as a rightist mentality in order to show the right how to be the right better and even how to show conservatism how to be conservative better to come in and say uh here's the problem every time you try and get in bed with the government every time you try and, and govern it, it it ends up going badly for you hey guess what the guys state, a piece of yeah. paper can't keep your rights intact well or or even but i think there's also a sense in which we can listen, learn from them as well like we could also they could very easily come back at us and say well the non-aggression principle is just a 
a gun-free zone for libertarians. They're like, well, yeah. Um, if you don't have, and I would say this is where conservatives to be like, uh, are right in which we can learn from them of like, yeah, really, and, and we Christian libertarians would agree with them and saying, well, yeah, it's because you don't believe in a transcendent judge who's going to uphold this law. Like, rule of law only works when there is a higher lawgiver. Um, and, and uh, but I think that we can we can come in and we can tell the conservatives how to be better conservatives. Like say, hey, first of all, just bring stop, just bring your children home. This isn't good for the conservative movement to have all of your kids dying in the sandbox. Um, you know, and and uh, this isn't good for families to have all of your kids sent off to to be propagandized by the people who hate you in public schools. Uh, it's it's not in your best interest, in, in the best interest of the family, to um, to empower a state that wants us separated and atomized. Like that that's what the the state wants us atomistic individuals. Like that's so interesting that they they all think that the anti government perspective is individualistic, but really, uh, and we talked about this actually in the episode with um our, our friend Isaac, who recently got married. Congratulations to him. Um, but, uh, but how the state uses collectivistic means to make us atomized individuals because the most controllable person is someone who can't do anything for their own, uh, for themselves. Like if you're not part of a community, if you are separated by yourself, then you need the government to control you. And so conservatives, if you, uh, shrink or even dis even get rid of the state, that is going to support community, not tear it apart. There's things like this where we can come in and say, with ideological grounding, we can help you to be better yeah. at the things that you want to accomplish. That's why Republicans with solid principles are so great. Massey, Ron Paul, yeah. etc. Like, they actually have that ideology to keep them grounded. They don't get swept up in this uh, yeah, you know, just a compass with no address type of thing. And and, and really, this the the uh, pandemic uh, regime has really shown the world how good Rand Paul is. He's also said some pretty silly things lately. Not happy with that, but um, he really how good he is because he was raised with principles. Yeah. Um. He's not, I mean, he's, he's not his dad. I wish he was more like his dad, but, but still like he has been given the chance to shine because he's been able to stand consistently yep. on principles. Massey has really shown his worth, um, during this time. And, and it's because he stands on principles and I think it's starting to wear off on others. Like we've got, um, yeah, there's just, I think, I think there's, uh, this is an area where I think the way we speak to the right needs to change. Like, so far, the libertarian strategy has been to look at the right and say, screw you. Well, how's that working out for us? Because the left ain't going to have us. I think that that's part of the reason I want us to be like, libertarianism needs to reclaim their rightist identity because you will always be the right to the left. Doesn't matter how much you, you say Black Lives Matter. Doesn't matter how much you say... Uh, whatever. It doesn't yeah. matter how much you say. Oh, I just want my gay married neighbor to be able to define his marijuana farm, defend his marijuana farm with a, his firearm, whatever. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter how much you say oh, that. That one drives me nuts. The, yeah, the left is not going to take you. They're not going to take us. Uh, acknowledge that you will always be on the right, and then look at the right and say we can help you to do this better. Yeah. Like there's it, there's a white blood cell aspect to this. Like they. They don't know what the bag... They don't n understand the enemy. They just know it needs to be gotten rid of. Like, this, that's going on with critical race theory in the public education system. It's what's going on with... Um, uh, there's another example. We just we brought it up a little while ago. Oh, war! Like, there's there's a sense in which they're, they're kind of starting to get that with war. They're trying to get... They're starting to get it with the industrial problem of China doing all of our, our industrial work for us, and there's we don't have jobs. Like, there is a sense in which they are right about the fact that that is a problem, that all of our goods are created in China. What they don't see is what makes that happen. Why is that? It's because it is not 
it's because the government has regulated and taxed to such an extent that that is a good, it is a better deal to ship g- crap over to America on ships and in planes than it is to make it in our own nation. Yeah, and but they don't see how uh, a trade war is not a solution to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the trade war is not going to solve it. It's just going to make goods more expensive. The yeah. real answer is to say, so let's beat them at their own game. But what's the problem? What is what is China doing well? It's it's enabling industrialization in their own nation. Um, it's doing it in a way that it is going to collapse. I think uh, actually, I, I just uh, in the last week I've been trying to get caught up on all my podcasts, and so I've I listened to a lot of Dave Smith the other day, and he had talked about how um, about that on his podcast a little while ago. It's like you know that what China's doing is a massive Keynesian bubble. Like they are an enti- they are a bubble as a nation. It's yeah. going to collapse. We don't need to engage a trade war. We need to let them fall apart and yeah. not set up our own bubble. And they will. But for all other reasons, for all other purposes, they should be all about Bitcoin because it's going to take down right. the U.S. dollar hegemony. But they hey. can't be about Bitcoin because they've just made it my, a giant Keynesian bet on and, uh, industrialization. Yeah. I just came up with the uh, the title for your next article, Darabelli. The conservative case for Bitcoin. Hey, there, there it is. is. Say something, Darabelli. Are you still alive? <laughs> I'm alive. I, uh, Are you awake? Though? I'm I don't listening so. and learning. He's like a sponge for knowledge. You know. You know what's so funny is like if you if your experience with Darabelli is only our podcast, you might think that he doesn't have a lot to say. That he doesn't know um, English. But <laughs> but honestly, like no, really. In our in our in our in our little communities, we've got uh, of discussion groups uh, online and on. Uh, uh, sorry, Keybase. We he's he's the one who's running all those conversations, and so you know you want to know what Darabelli thinks. You send a, add him on Twitter. He's got a lot to say. Uh, he just can't get a word in edgewise with us loudmouths. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to add to um, our list for uh, the next episode. Um, talking about what you guys just brushed on in terms of China and and uh, shipping stuff overseas, but the U.S. policy with the petrodollar over the last fifty years, um, in addition to everything else that you talked about, has created a system where um, it just destroyed the middle class, it destroyed um, middle class jobs, it destroyed manufacturing in America because it was um, convenient for those who get to make the decisions um, to create the U.S. dollar system, the U.S. global um, system for the U.S. dollar uh, that we have nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's that's another area where we could, and, and I know like this is the, the Horton, Horton's law, one of Horton's laws is, uh, Scott Horton's law is, uh, you know, attack the right from the right, attack the left from the left. I think, I, I maybe wouldn't use that phrase. I would instead say, uh, teach the right from the right. I think there's a sense in which we don't have to treat them like an enemy. We can come at them and say, all these things that you're looking for, well, not all of them, but most of them, you know, all, affirm all the good things they're doing and say, we can help you do it better. And I think one of the ways we can do that is, um, what you're talking about is go after the Federal Reserve. And, re- and that's really like what so much of Ron Paul's success was showing the right how to be anti war and, uh, in. St- telling them what's going on at the fed yeah and and showing them like there's it's one of those things that like it was so fascinating and i've, I've said this before when when i first heard of ron paul i think i said I actually said this one our with our interview with uh jared of the hoppian um the first time i heard heard uh the libertarians they were always going on and on and on and on about the fed and i was like my gosh what's the most that's the most nerdy thing you can talk about <laughs> but really once you if you can red pill someone on the fed like the rest of it just falls into place, like because because it is so far reaching. Like the effects of the Fed, uh, Jimmy Song on our episode twenty. Go listen to that. I mean, I'm plugging all of our episodes today. I'm, a, I'm just the uh, the I'm the SEO optimizer in this show. If anyone uh, makes but, it this far in, they'll actually go listen to him too. So that's good. <laughs> but episode twenty, Jimmy Song, like he in that episode with us, and I'm sure he's done it elsewhere. But he really made the conservative case to be against the Fed. Um. And and it, the way that it affects culture, the way that it affects art, like our art is 
such like art is garbage today and, and it's it has some so much to do with the high time preference society created by the federal reserve the fact that people can't or won't have families and can't or won't settle down in a house this is all laid at the feet of the federal reserve um the fact that like someone had pointed out recently like, i think it was tim Dillon being like recently like well you know our, our fam our our the boomers aren't retiring out of their large houses and finding a small condo. Well, the federal reserve makes that a bad investment. Right. Like, why would they do that? Their, their, the greatest asset is still their house. Um, as much as the, um, you know, they replace the real estate bubble with another real estate bubble. Uh, and it's like so much of the evils of this world that the conservatives complain about so much of this, like this, this anti-family values, this, this constant revolution, like we want the new thing, the new thing, the new thing, that consumeristic mindset that tears apart families, this is all laid at the foot of the Federal Reserve. And uh, if everyone can see that, that the, the Austrian case for sound money, whether it's Bitcoin or hard money or whatever it is, like this is a strong case that we're not taking advantage of to try and uh, pull some conservatives our way and pull libertarians our way and, uh, or not libertarians, sorry, rightists our way. Um, but of course, uh, liber the libertarian, dege the degenerate libertarian uh, mainstream is, is not, there's not, none of that's going to happen. Um, yeah. And so all these, all these conversations that we have um, where we try to figure it out and try to understand what's going on and try to, um, know move people closer to our opinions um we all have these because the government actually has some effect on our life um a significantly large measurable effect and yeah. that is directly related to the federal reserve where like it's i mean it is true that you can say bad money causes crappy art in society there's a bit of a trail to go from the one to the other but it's so easy to to draw the line between bad money and too big of a government and if you have whatever whatever your sound money is if you have a sound money standard your government is small and limited and they can't print and um if they want to spend money that they don't have they're gonna have to tax their people um and then the people will be like no i don't want to do that um and so like one of the very practical applications of a solution here is just take money out of the hands of the government. And I mean, that's, that's where Ron Paul was and the fed. Um, if, if, if the federal reserve can, you know, go away and get out of bed with the federal government, um, so much, um, will improve just because the money itself will get better. Yeah.